Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are back with our discussion of cardiac physiology, and this is recording part two. Now we're going to start a discussion of cardiac output. Cardiac output is very simply the volume of blood that the heart pumps out per minute, and so it's expressed in liters per minute. We can calculate cardiac output by looking at the number of beats per minute, which is the heart rate, multiplied by the stroke volume, which is the volume of blood pumped per contraction. A normal cardiac output is about five liters per minute, but it does vary quite a bit depending on patients' metabolic level, their activity, their age, and their size. For this reason, sometimes we use the cardiac index, which corrects the cardiac output based on the patient's size using their body surface area, which is measured in meters squared. So if cardiac output is in liters per minute, cardiac out in index is in liters per minute per meter squared. And a normal cardiac index in an adult is about 2.5 to 4.2 liters per minute per meter squared. This figure here shows how the right heart sends 100% of its cardiac output to the lungs, which returns it to the left heart. But the left heart sends cardiac output to a variety of different organs. Uh, large percentages of cardiac output go to the kidneys and to the splanchnic circulation. Relatively smaller amounts go to the heart, and we'll talk more about distribution of cardiac output later on. Now, when cardiac output is insufficient to deliver enough oxygen to tissues, then the tissues are consuming so much oxygen that when we examine the blood that returns to the right heart, which is called the mixed venous oxygen saturation, or the SVO2, that number will actually be decreased more than usual. We're showing that there's more oxygen consumption for the given amount of blood that's being sent to the tissues. And so SVO2 is actually useful as a measure of the adequacy of cardiac output. Now we're going to talk about some other concepts related to cardiac output, and the first one is venous return. Venous return is simply the volume of blood that flows into the heart from the venous system per minute. And this introduces us to a concept called the Frank-Starling mechanism, which says that when venous return increases, the heart will fill more and it will start to stretch. And this stretching action causes the heart muscle to squeeze with an increased contractile force, it also increases heart rate through a mechanism at the sinus node, and it increases heart rate due to sympathetic inputs, and this is called the Bainbridge reflex. So we see in general venous return increasing leads to an increase in cardiac output. Now stroke volume depends on several different variables, and we will discuss each of them here. The preload, the afterload, the contractility, any valvular dysfunction, and then any wall motion abnormalities. Starting with preload. Preload is officially defined as the left ventricular end diastolic volume. So if we just think about that for a minute, left ventricle, end diastolic, which means at the end of relaxation or at the end of filling right before contraction begins, volume. So how full does the heart get right before it starts to contract? And that's the preload. Preload obviously depends on ventricular filling. There is something called the Frank-Starling law, which describes the relationship between cardiac output and left ventricular and diastolic volume, and that is shown in the figure here. Let's start with a normal heart, and this shows that as preload increases, cardiac output also increases, and this makes sense based on what we've discussed so far. And if we exercise, we incorporate other factors which will cause the heart to have even more cardiac output at a given preload. Now this doesn't work forever. Obviously at some point we have so much venous return that the heart starts to max out and cannot generate any more cardiac output no matter how much preload you give it. We can also take patients who are unhealthy, who are in heart failure or cardiogenic shock, and we see that they tend to max out not at some maximal activity but at some lower activity. Here's a patient with heart failure who maxes out below the cardiac output that you need to safely walk. Patient in shock maxes out their cardiac output before they even have enough cardiac output to maintain perfusion at rest. And then additional preload actually sends their cardiac output back down. They're what we might call overloaded. 
and they go into failure. That is the Frank Starling law. We see that each of these curves shows that if heart rate and contractility remain constant, that defines one of these curves, then cardiac output is proportional to preload until excessive volumes are reached. And so we've discussed the ventricular function curves here. Ventricular filling, as we said, depends on venous return to the heart. So this depends on things like blood volume. Obviously, if a patient is hypovolemic, then they won't have much preload. Also, the distribution of their existing blood volume, and that can change based on the patient's position, on their intrathoracic pressure, on their pericardial pressure, or on their venous tone. The patient's rhythm is also important. Patients who are in atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, or who are in junctional rhythms, are unable to fill their ventricles in the most efficient way. And this can reduce the ventricular filling by 20 to 30 percent. That decreases preload and therefore decreases cardiac output. And heart rate to a point is good for cardiac output, but when it becomes too elevated, there isn't actually enough time for the heart to fill. And so we have an increased heart rate, but stroke volume starts to go down, leading once again to a decrease in cardiac output. Preload is usually the same for the left and the right heart because, as we've seen, whatever comes in the right heart goes 100% to the left heart. Unless there's a real big pulmonary problem or some right heart dysfunction, usually their preloads are the same. Now, how do we measure left ventricular end diastolic volume if we want to know a patient's preload? Um, we could obviously use an echocardiogram or some imaging to take a picture, but that's not always available to us. So maybe we could measure left ventricular end diastolic pressure. We know that pressure and volume are usually related. Um, and maybe we could stick a probe inside the left ventricle and measure left ventricular end diastolic volume. Well, it turns out you can't exactly do that because the relationship between pressure and volume isn't totally linear. And that concept is a concept that's actually very intuitive if you think about it, that's called compliance. Compliance says that here I'm increasing volume, and if it was a rigid box, as volume goes up, I would expect pressure to go up. But the heart has some compliance, so even though volume is going up, pressures stay relatively low, sort of like a balloon, but then as it becomes more and more full, pressures start to rise. Now, it's not really easy to put a probe in the left ventricle either, unless you are some interventionalist running a catheter up the aorta into the heart. So we need to find other ways to approximate left ventricular end diastolic volume and preload. So we'll work from best to worst. If we can't put a probe in the left ventricle, or rather the left atrium, then maybe it's hard to put a probe in the pulmonary vein that's leading back to the uh, heart from the lungs, but maybe we could put something in the pulmonary artery, which is before the lungs. That's something we can access from the venous system. So here is a central line going in, let's say, the internal jugular vein. It comes through the superior vena cava, into the right atrium, through the right ventricle, out the pulmonary valve, into the pulmonary artery, and into the pulmonary artery as it sends blood to the lungs. If I, and this is called a pulmonary artery catheter, or a Swan-Gans catheter sometimes. If I inflate the balloon, which exists at the tip of this catheter, then the pressure transducer that's just distal to the balloon is no longer measuring any of the pressure behind the balloon. It's only measuring back pressure that's being transmitted from the lungs. And where are the lungs getting that, that hydrostatic pressure? From the pulmonary vein. And where is it getting its hydrostatic pressure? From the left side of the heart. And so we see that the pulmonary artery pressure, and we actually call this the pulmonary capillary wed pressure, or the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And this can be used as an approximate measure of left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which we saw that we can use to approximate left ventricular end diastolic volume, which we can use to help assess a patient's preload. Since one of the big questions in anesthesia and in critical care is knowing a patient's volume status, is the patient hypotensive because they're volume depleted or because they're septic? And the knowledge of the patient's volume status is critical to our ability to take care of critically ill patients. And giving them too much fluid can be very detrimental, as we saw on the curves just a couple slides ago, where we saw patients with poor hearts not responding well to excess volume. So we see a pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is one invasive way to determine a patient's volume status.
we could actually measure what we would call their pulmonary artery pressure. That would be done with the balloon deflated. And at that point, we're measuring pulmonary pressures here. Uh, sorry, not pulmonary pressures, but pulmonary artery pressures. Or we could even measure central venous pressure, which is measured somewhere here in the right atrium or in the SVC, preferably in the right atrium. Um, and as you can see, each one of these steps is further and further removed from the left ventricle, introduces more sources of error, first from the lungs and then from the pulmonary vasculature and then from valves all the way back. But each one is also a little bit less invasive. Now, we talked a moment ago about ventricular compliance and the notion that pressures and volumes don't always line up. And while it's hard for us to measure volumes and easier for us to measure pressures, we are, we are limited by that sometimes. So what affects ventricular compliance? That is the relationship between volume and pressure. Well, there are some factors that are intrinsic to the heart muscle. So for example, hearts can become hypertrophied. And when hearts overwork, we see this in hypertension or aortic stenosis. Just like any muscle, the heart muscle begins to grow and thicken, and this thickened muscle has less compliance. The same can happen in hearts that have ischemia or fibrosis. And then there are extrinsic factors, things that push on the heart. So pericardial disease, which limits the ability of the heart to expand fully. Distension of the right ventricle can impede the ability of the left ventricle to fill. Increased airway pressures, tumors, and surgical compression, all of these things also affect ventricular compliance. And again, that's important because if the relationship between volume and pressure is distorted, then our ability to use pressure as a way to assess a patient's volume is also compromised. So that's all about preload, heart filling. But that's only one of the five topics that we want to discuss in this section. The next section that um, has an impact on ventricular performance is afterload. Afterload is most simply thought of as blood pressure. It's the arterial pressure. And we call it the afterload because it's the pressure that the ventricle has to overcome to eject blood. The heart isn't just ejecting blood into a bucket, it's injecting it into a closed fluid system. And that system has some pressure in it. We usually measure this by a term called systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. And there's an equation to measure this, which you don't need to memorize for my course, but you may need to memorize for other courses in the program or perhaps for your board exams. Um, SVR can be calculated as AD times the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the CVP divided by the cardiac output. And a normal SVR has a very unusual unit. The units are dynes, seconds per centimeter to the fifth. Normal SVR is in the range of 900 to 1500. And just like cardiac output, which we could index to a patient's body surface area, we can index SVR as well. So we can make an SVRI, an SVR index, and all we would do is instead of using cardiac output, we would use cardiac index instead. This concept of afterload exists for both the left and the right heart. So the left heart has a systemic vascular resistance. The right heart pumps against a pulmonary vascular resistance, a PVR. And it's calculated exactly the same way, except instead of using mean arterial pressure and CVP, we use pulmonary artery pressure and left atrial pressure. How do we measure left atrial pressure? It's hard to stick a venous catheter into the left atrium, as we saw on the figure before. So we use our pulmonary artery pressure, our pulmonary artery catheter, rather, to assess the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. And that is our substitute for left atrial pressure. A normal PVR is much, much lower. The pulmonary system is a low um, resistance system with uh, comparably uh, only 50 to 150 compared to 90 to 1500 for the SVR. The next topic to discuss is contractility. Now contractility is not the same as cardiac output. Cardiac output is just liters per minute of blood that's being pumped. Contractility, which is also called inotropy, is the ability of the heart to pump. It's how strong the heart is, how good of a pump is it, how efficient. It's really the rate of myocardial muscle shortening, which is contraction. Things like sympathetic activity can increase contractility and make the heart pump stronger. We would see this during stress or exercise. And all sorts of things can decrease contractility, like acidosis, hypoxia, ischemia, 
infarction. And in fact, most of our anesthetics are um, cardiac depressants, which means that they decrease contractility. If a heart has some sort of wall motion abnormality, this also decreases its ability to pump efficiently and decreases contractility. So for example, if a region of the heart doesn't contract in a nice synchronized fashion, and this can happen if the heart muscle is damaged from ischemia or scarring or from hypertrophy or some sort of a conduction problem, we can have hypokinesis, which means it doesn't move as well as the rest of the heart. We can have a portion of the wall that has akinesis, which means it doesn't move at all. And in fact, in fact, if you have a heart attack that destroys a lot of the cellular structure of a portion of the heart wall, you can actually get dyskinesis, which means when the heart squeezes, part of the heart actually bulges out instead. All of these decrease ventricular performance by decreasing contractility. Next, we talk about the valves. As we said earlier, each valve can have stenosis, which impairs forward flow, or regurgitation, which causes inappropriate backward flow, or valves can have both. And all of these reduce your stroke volume by making it harder for the heart to eject blood efficiently. So for example, patients who have stenosis of their AV valves can't fill their ventricles well, and so they have decreased preload. Patients who have stenosis of their semilunar valves, like their aortic valve, have increased afterload because they're pumping against a uh, sort of like a, a, a tiny opening. If patients have regurgitation of their AV valves, then they have backward flow. So the heart may be pumping well, but the blood's part of the blood is going in the wrong direction. So their cardiac output is low because their ejection is low. And if patients have regurgitation of their semilunar valve, like their aortic valve, then they're able to pump out blood very well, but some of it comes right back in during diastole. And so once again, their ventricular performance is decreased. Well, that's an awful lot to cover in one video, but we've had a nice discussion of ventricular performance. Please take a few minutes to review it, jot down any questions you have, and let me know about them either in person or by email or in class, and we'll continue with the next recording.